Before we begin, I want to thank Babbel for sponsoring this video. With summer already here, it is a time where many folks make the decision to travel abroad and visit various places. Should you decide to go to a location where you don't speak the language, then Babbel is an excellent option to help you learn. Taking the time to study another language not only help you feel more comfortable in a foreign country, but it is also a good way to show respect to the local people wherever you may go. Personally, I've used Babbel to keep my Spanish skills fresh. The app uses real-world practical conversations to help you learn, beginning with simple but important phrases like aprendo espanol to donde está el aeropuerto as you advance through learning your selected language. Babbel gives you various options like games, videos, and podcasts to learn from. One can easily fit their 10-minute individual lessons in at any convenient time of day. By clicking the link in the description, you can get 65% off your purchase of Babbel right now and start learning a new language today. On August 10th of 2018, 56-year-old Earl Rocky Ashworth and his dog Cruiser traveled with friends Nicole, Martin, Janet, and Jessica along the Seward Highway in Alaska in order to go gold panning. They stopped near Milepost 56, just south of the Hope Highway and Seward Highway Junction, where Martin stated he had a gold mining claim. In order to access the claim, you have to take a 4x4 trail which leads to a small camping area and trailhead. The following details are the narrative as described by Nicole. The group arrived at the campsite and trailhead at approximately 5 p.m. At this point, Nicole, Martin, Janet, and Jessica began the short hike down to the creek bed to start gold panning. The trail down to the claim is approximately a quarter mile in length and very steep. There is a rope along the trail to assist people with hiking up and down. As Jessica was leaving, she turned around and noticed Earl still standing at the trailhead with his dog and asked if he was going to follow them. Earl was smoking a cigarette and told her that he would join them in just a little bit. Jessica then continued on down the trail and onto the gold panning area with the others. Earl would never make it down to the gold claim. An hour would pass and Jessica would head back up the trail around 6 p.m. looking for Earl to see why he had not come down to the creek. She made it to the campsite and Earl was nowhere to be found and his dog Cruiser was there alone. Jessica then went back down the trail to notify Martin, Janet, and Nicole about the situation. All four then began searching for Earl in the vicinity of where he was last seen. While everyone was looking for Earl, Janet began freaking out and entered Earl's vehicle and tore up the ignition. Janet then left the area walking on foot, leaving the others to deal with the situation. At the time of his disappearance, Earl had no survival gear with him and his friends would later tell police that he is not a hiker and he had bad knees and a bad back. The group did not report Earl as missing to the Alaska State Troopers until 12.15 a.m roughly six hours after Earl had disappeared. Nicole was the one who made the initial call and was the first to be interviewed by Alaska troopers. Nicole told the responding trooper that she still had Earl's dog with her as well as Earl's cell phone. When asked about why she waited so long to report Earl as missing, she stated that she was unsure on what time they arrived at the campsite and went down to the creek bed. The trooper noted in his report that Nicole was laughing at times during the interview, which he found odd. He writes that in his experience, he had never interviewed someone about their missing friend and have them laugh about it. The trooper report also notes that Nicole's voice sounded stressed. When asked if she or anyone else on scene had been consuming drugs or alcohol, Nicole stated that no one was under the influence of either. When asked if anyone had been arguing with Earl recently, Nicole stated that everyone was happy to go gold panning and that no one had been arguing. The trooper obtained Earl's cell phone number and attempted to call him, but it went straight to voicemail. At 12.40 a.m., the trooper contacted the local search and rescue coordinator and informed him about the incident. Due to the terrain, darkness, and weather at the time, no SAR team was able to respond until daybreak. By 2 p.m., additional troopers had been on scene conducting a hasty search, 
but were unable to find Earl in the area. Helicopters were put in the air and began an extensive search of the creek bed and surrounding terrain. Dog teams arrived, but none of them alerted to finding any scent related to Earl. During the search, investigators began learning more about Earl, including that he was a suspected drug dealer in the Palmer area. Nicole, Jessica, and Martin were also known drug users, according to Alaska State Troopers. Their report mentions that Nicole, Jessica, Martin, and Earl were not hikers and not known to Goldpan. Investigators began the process of obtaining search warrants for Earl's residence and cell phone, and also conduct interviews with Nicole, Jessica, and Martin. The whereabouts of Janet were still unknown. By 9.20 p.m., all search teams were pulled out of the field due to darkness and the small search area. It was advised that there was no more area to be searched that would be of value. The first investigators on scene took thorough notes and also took photographs of the campsite and items of evidentiary value, including food, empty beer and soda cans, empty cigarette packs, a discarded press-on nail, and a backpack containing empty prescription bottles. When troopers had first arrived on scene, a campfire was still smoldering. Earl's vehicle was inspected and it was noted that the fuel door was opened and the gas cap removed as if an unknown person had siphoned fuel from Earl's car. The trooper also noted damage to the ignition where it appeared someone had punched the ignition or tried to start it without the key. Only the passenger side door was unlocked. Investigators noted in their report that it appeared none of the gold panning equipment had been used and was dry. During the day, a state trooper called Palmer Police Department to have them respond to Earl's residence and see if he had somehow made it home, but soon learned that Palmer PD had already been to Earl's residence after receiving a 911 hang-up from Earl's cell phone. Upon arriving, Palmer PD had found Nicole, Jessica, and Martin were already there and were moving items out of Earl's residence. Palmer police identified the trio and secured the apartment. It appears Palmer PD was unaware at the time that Earl Ashworth was in fact missing. The search warrant for Earl's residence was soon granted, but investigators found no indications of a struggle or possible homicide at the conclusion of their search. Investigators were able to bring Jessica in to be interviewed, and her story differed slightly in details compared to the one Nicole had given. Jessica stated she and Earl drove to the claim in his sedan, while Martin, Janet, and Nicole took Martin's black jeep. They didn't know exactly where they were going and it wasn't planned. When they arrived in the area, all of them except Earl walked down the hill away from the campsite. She said Earl was busy putting on his waders because he didn't plan ahead and was wearing flip-flops. After being at the creek for about an hour, Jessica went looking for Earl but couldn't find him. She alerted the others and Martin spent two hours searching but turned up nothing. While looking, Earl's dog came out of the woods halfway down the trail to the creek. Eventually, everyone except Janet left the area in order to call 911. When they later returned to the camping area, they found Janet was inside Earl's car rummaging around. There was a verbal argument with lots of screaming and Janet stormed off. Once she was gone, the others noticed that Janet had ripped the ignition out of Earl's car. Jessica had Earl's phone, though she doesn't specify why she had it, and she brought it with her back home. She stated that her sister stole the phone from her and called 911 from it in order to get her in trouble. This 911 call resulted in Palmer PD showing up at Earl's residence. Jessica does not state why her sister would want to get her in trouble. Investigators re-interviewed Nicole after Jessica and learned a few new details. Earl had his keys to his car when he disappeared and his dog Cruiser was older and wouldn't have traveled far from his side. Martin got pulled over by a park ranger while searching for Earl in his car and was forced to walk back to camp after the ranger discovered he did not have a license. Notably, Martin did not take the opportunity to inform the ranger of his missing friend. Nicole stated that Janet was attempting to hotwire Earl's vehicle, but couldn't get it to work and eventually ended up walking away. 
The group called 911 to get people to start looking for him, and Martin, Jessica, and Nicole used Martin's Jeep to drive to Earl's house, but ran out of gas several times along the way. Nicole noted that Earl took several medications and is bipolar when he doesn't take them. On August 13th, investigators contacted Jessica to retrieve Earl's phone from her. Jessica said that her sister Andrea had taken the phone away and never given it back. Officials went to see Andrea about the phone, but she told them that she had left it at another woman's house earlier in the day. When investigators went to that home, they encountered a male who did not want to identify himself and said the phone was not there. After trying to chase down the location of Earl's cell phone all day, detectives were ultimately unsuccessful. Calling the phone continued to go straight to voicemail. On August 14th, Janet was finally located living in a tent at a homeless encampment. Investigators were able to interview her on location and hear her side of the story. Janet stated that she was the last person to see Earl before she went down the trail, and he said he was going to relieve himself in the bushes while she was getting her stuff together. She assumed at the time that Earl had already gone down the trail and was ahead of her, but upon reaching the creek, she noticed he was nowhere to be found. She admitted to attempting to hotwire Earl's car and she walked away after getting into an argument with Jessica. From there, she was able to hitchhike into town. She denied knowing anything about Earl's whereabouts. Investigators received a call from Earl's mother, Joyce, on August 16th. She spoke to them at length about numerous issues her son had with mental health problems and his abuse of multiple different drugs. She stated that he was behind on all his bills and was going through a rough period. On August 25th, roughly two weeks after Earl's disappearance, another large-scale search was conducted in the area of the mining claim. Despite numerous teams, canines, and grid searches, no new evidence was discovered relating to Earl's whereabouts. On November 21st, Investigators received information relating to a warrant to search Earl's phone records. The records showed no suspicious activity. On November 26th, after attempting to ascertain the whereabouts of Martin for a number of weeks, investigators learned that he was incarcerated at a facility in Alaska and were able to set up an interview with him by phone. Martin's version of events matched the others with him leading the group down the trail to the creek before eventually noticing that Earl was missing. Martin searched for him for a while before the group decided to return to the Palmer area. Martin stated that Jessica found Earl's cell phone in his vehicle prior to leaving the campsite. Investigators found that Martin's story largely corroborated that of the other witnesses and determined that nothing criminal had occurred. The case was subsequently closed pending any further leads. The disappearance of Earl Ashworth holds similarity to a number of other cases where an individual is there one minute and gone the next. An additional layer of complexity is added by the rather odd behavior displayed by Earl's friends in the hours and days subsequent to his disappearance. It might be easy to look at this behavior and say that they must be involved in some sort of foul play, but it must also be considered that this is reportedly a group of addicts, most of whom seem to be struggling in their own individual lives. Their behavior may simply not be what most people would expect from individuals whose friend had just gone missing, and not necessarily be indicative of foul play. Given that Earl was not a very mobile person, with bad knees and a bad back, and also considering the fact that most people said he would not leave his dog's side, it would seem there are few other options to consider than some sort of foul play element. If Earl had wandered off into the steep forested slopes of the area, he likely would not have gotten far, and wherever he was able to go, he would have likely been found by the teams of canines that scoured the hillside during the initial search operation. Strangely, no search dog picked up on his scent. Was the story told by Earl's companions not entirely true, or was Earl never there in the first place? His vehicle got to the location somehow, and according to his companions, he disappeared with his keys. 
This is perhaps the explanation for why Jessica attempted to hotwire Earl's car. After that failed, it is likely they attempted to siphon gas from Earl's car and put it in Martin's vehicle, but they were still unable to get very far as the report mentions the group running out of gas as they tried to leave the area. There are numerous elements to this story that don't truly add up. Was the group really going to this rather remote location to gold pan? There is certainly a feeling that we don't have all the relevant information in this case. Whether or not those key pieces of this mystery are ever discovered, only time will tell. Until next time, thanks for watching.